Hello, friends, and welcome to Sterile Field Guide, a podcast dedicated to medical student general surgical education. I'm Alex, and I'll be your guide. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode nine. We are going to wrap up our series on what happens in the trauma bay by talking about the trauma secondary survey. So in the last three episodes, yes, three episodes, it took me a very long time to talk about this topic. We talked about the trauma primary survey, which includes going over airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. The trauma secondary survey is sort of everything else and in a broad sense really just includes a very thorough but very quick physical exam. So in this episode, I just want to talk about how that physical exam is done and so that if you are participating in this at our institution, we call it a trauma junior, but if as a medical student or a young resident you are participating in a trauma activation for the very first time and are doing your physical exam, this is going to be an example of some of the language that you may hear or you yourself may be telling to the room. Again, I think this may be institution specific, so watch a couple before you start going rogue, but this should give you sort of a vague understanding of what's going on. Um, And maybe they do it the same way everywhere. (laughs) I'm really not sure uh, because I, only had the privilege of going to one medical school and working at one hospital. So for now, we'll see what happens in a couple of years. I guess next year. That's terrifying. Let's move on. So talking about the secondary survey. So we have done the primary survey. The patient is, as far as we are concerned for right now, as stable as we can get them. You at this time will probably receive a handoff from the first responders who are delivering this patient to you if they are involved in care. Some patients do walk into the emergency room, but if there's a first responder um, involved, you may at this time receive a history, um, a very brief handoff. And there is a mnemonic from ATLS that um, they sort of recommend for handoffs. And ATLS is a course for first responders as well. And so this, sorry, that was my refrigerator. This uh, handoff includes MIST or MIST. So M for mechanism, I for injuries, S for signs and symptoms, and T for treatment initiated. For mechanism, This is going to be important for sleuthing out any potential injuries, if there's any vagueness in physical exam findings or even imaging, um, or if you have concerns about fractures, C-spine precautions, like knowing the mechanism of injury can be helpful when moving forward and deciding what to do. Knowing the injuries, of course, is helpful as far as the first responders are concerned. What injuries they saw, what things they have done for it, um, that's important. You obviously will be discovering more injuries and maybe doing some imaging to further parse those things out as you move forward. But knowing the injuries in like a vague sense being like there is a gunshot wound to the left lower extremity great. Okay, we know that that's there and we can move from there. Symptoms and signs, this is sort of, you know what these are, but if the patient is hypotensive and they were aggressive and all these different things, like they'll just give you basically a history. And then treatment initiated, some things I think are particularly interesting from this part is like, did they get blood en route? Did they require any um, medication, sedation? Um, Did they get fluids? in route, like, was their blood pressure ever at a point where you really thought, wow, this person needs resuscitation because that is important to know. Did the patient get intubated on the way or do they have like a super glottic airway? Like knowing the things that, and you'll probably know this, like before your primary survey in some settings, like if they've been intubated, you'll obviously know that when the airway comes up. But all of these things are important in figuring out like, okay, well, the patient looks pretty good right now, but we also just gave them four units of blood. So we'll keep an eye on it. Also, I would say to help out your residents as a medical student, pay attention to the opening pressure. So opening pressure is just the blood pressure that you get when they first get into the room. This it usually goes in the note, knowing that opening pressure is important, and it will probably be documented, but it can be important when writing handoffs or when staffing the patient with 
uh, someone, especially if it if an attending or a fellow is is not present, especially if it's not like a level one activation. And then um, noting the general injuries that the patient has can be important when you're in the room. Knowing if they've gotten blood and route and those sorts of things can be helpful in the moment before everyone has their H and P's in, um, because the intern or the resident may need to know these things before all of the documentation is finished. The history that you will try or the person at the head of the bed will try to elucidate from the patient um, is the ample history. We did cover this in a prior episode, but I'll go through it briefly. So ample stands for A, allergies, M, medications or substances, P, past medical history, L, last meal, E, environment or events. For medications specifically, you want to know about blood thinners, um, substances, alcohol, or other substances that could give you a clue about the etiology of their trauma, especially if it's like pretty super vague and they're like, oh yes, I also just used cocaine and I have this chest pain. You're like, okay, well, I'm a little bit worried about your aorta. So those sorts of things are important to ask if the patient is awake or if the first responder knows their history. Last meal, of course, we talked about this in the other episode, but important from an anesthesia perspective, important as far as their aspiration risk is concerned. And then environment and events, we we know that that is important to know, like what happened to them. So again, if the patient is awake, the person at the head of the bed will be doing this. And then at the very same time, at least at my institution, people will be attaching monitors, getting an IV or two IVs, ideally drawing blood, etc. while the person at the head of the bed asks these questions. Some of the blood tests that may be drawn right away include a glucose. They may be getting a type in screen, which will help guide us to better blood resuscitation without depleting the very, very precious O negative and O positive trauma blood that we have in our emergency departments. So as far as a secondary survey physical exam goes, this is going to be head to toe and this may be split up between different people. My tips as a medical student for completing this and being the person yelling out to the room, it can be pretty scary the first time or nerve wracking maybe is a better word. It can be nerve wracking to do this the first time, but my tip is to keep it simple. You cannot do anything wrong necessarily during this exam. So what you need to do is just say the findings. Okay, so like if a finding that you really believe that the abdomen is distended and they're later, they think the abdomen is not distended, that is not a life-changing thing that you have said. You just need to say what you believe to be true and move on. So don't think about it too much because this does need to happen quickly. And some common language, I think number one, know what side of the bed you're on um, because in like the moment when you're feeling really worked up, to have to say like the right leg versus the left leg um, that can save you some time to be like I am on the right side of the bed so I will be talking about the right side of the body that can be helpful to just like keep track of in your brain and then some common language laceration you can say there's a laceration you can say a large laceration a small laceration you can say a bruise or you can say ecchymoses a traumatic is used a lot I will also talk about the normal language for most parts of the exam. Not all parts, obviously, but some things that are like pertinent negatives that you probably will be saying as a medical student if you are participating in this exam. So starting with the head to toe survey. For the head, you will evaluate everything. So the scalp, the eyes, ears, nose, mouth, trachea, and neck. So for the scalp, you're looking for big lacerations, hematomas, those sorts of things. For eyes, you are looking for mobility of the eyes. So you want to make sure extraocular movements are intact, especially if there's concern for facial fractures, because you really do not want to have entrapment of the muscles. This is an ophthalmologic emergency. You can also at this time notice if the eyes are bulging, if there's any concern for like increased ocular pressure, which is also an ophthalmologic emergency. So those are some things that you want to note. You also want to note the pupillary size at this time. Looking in the In the ears, you will look for hemotympanum. If there is blood behind the tympanic membranes or the eardrums, this is a concern for a basal skull fracture or skull base fracture. And so that's important to note. 
Also with the eyes, for fractures, if you see raccoon eyes, this can be concerning. If you see battle sign, which is bruising posterior to the ear, posterior bruising, that can be concerning for a basal skull fracture as well. You'll also look in the nose. You'll check for stability of the face. You can look in the mouth um, to make sure that the airway is clear and there's no bleeding, or there may be lots of bleeding, but you would call these things out. And then you will look at the trachea and the neck as well. Looking at the trachea specifically, looking for deviation. So normal language would be like trachea is midline. If trachea is not midline, what you are concerned about in this scenario is tension pneumothorax. It can be caused by other things, but that's sort of like the thing that you want to be thinking about when you have tracheal deviation. Um, Tension pneumothorax can cause that. And we talked about in prior episodes, tension pneumothorax causing hemodynamic collapse because of compression of venous structures because they are a relatively low pressure. And so when you have extra pressure in your chest, you can compress those venous structures. You do not have blood return to the heart and therefore you are not pumping blood to your body. And that is bad. And you need to resolve that quickly. You can do this by needle decompression or you can do it by finger thoracostomy and placement of chest tubes. We talked about all this in a prior episode, but just as a reminder for those sorts of things. And then you're looking for um, mobility of the eyes if you're able, if the patient's awake and able to follow commands. That is helpful. For the chest, normal language is going to be like chest wall is stable bilaterally. There is no chest wall tenderness or crepitus. Crepitus, if you've never heard of crepitus before, this is when you have air in the subcutaneous tissue. Um, This is also called like subcutaneous emphysema. But basically, this can happen when you have gas forming bacteria because now you have a bunch of air in the subcutaneous tissue when there's an infection. But more so in trauma, this is we would be more concerned that an air-filled structure has an injury to it with enough force that it has now entered or been pushed into the subcutaneous tissue. And so these sorts of injuries include things like tracheobronchial injuries. You can have like a pneumothorax injury to the lung can cause things like this, and then like esophageal rupture. So when we talk about esophageal rupture and tracheobronchial injury, some things you may see on your boards. I know when I was studying for step two, this is something that came up was Hammond sign, which is Hammond sign and neck crepitus together make you concerned about tracheobronchial injuries or esophageal rupture. And I believe that in step two studying, this is sort of like the buzzwords for esophageal rupture, but the Hammond sign is, it's also called Hammond's crunch. And so this is like a crunchy sound that happens with the heartbeat and it's heard over the chest. And so if you have this as well as crepitus, you may be concerned for esophageal rupture or tracheobronchial injury. So when you're feeling for crepitus, I feel like this is one of those things that once you feel it, you know what it feels like. Everybody always describes it as like Rice Krispies. You can use your fingertips and kind of like push them along the skin. And if it feels like bubbly underneath the skin, that is crepitus. But once you feel it, you'll feel it. And if you feel like you feel it, just say it out loud and it is okay if you're wrong. But if you, if you believe that that is what you're feeling, it is okay to say that. The first time I ever felt crepitus was during a trauma activation and I was, I said it and it was true. So trust your, trust your gut. Unstable chest wall can be concerning for rib fractures. Rib fractures are relatively common in trauma, especially blunt trauma. And something that we are concerned about that we spoke about in a previous episode is flailed chest and remember that flail chest is a segment of ribs that is broken that moves paradoxically with with breathing and this can cause respiratory distress because you are using a a ton of extra energy to breathe but also you are not breathing efficiently because that rib segment is not allowing your lung to fully expand and so this is defined as three ribs broken in two or more places so if anyone ever asks you how you define flail chest, you will say that it is three or more ribs broken in two or more places. So it has to be a free floating plate of ribs. For the abdomen, normal language, just like in a normal abdomen, abdominal exam would be abdomen is soft, non-tender and non-distended in all four quadrants. You will probably not be listening to bowel sounds in the trauma bay. I do not believe that I've ever seen that happen. So you won't comment on bowel sounds. Some things to be looking for obviously like distension, tenderness, those sorts of things are good to know, but also you can look for bruising patterns. You can um, feel for 
like rebound tenderness, peritonitis, firmness of the abdomen, those are things to be concerned about. So some things that you may see while you're studying for your shelf would be things like a handlebar injury or seatbelt sign. So handlebar injury is typically the story is there's like a child on a bicycle and they somehow flip over the bicycle and the handlebar hits them in the abdomen. And the things that are sort of tested on in this realm are going to be like pancreatic and duodenal injuries or duodenal, however you like to say it and hear it. So handlebar injury, typically like pancreatic or duodenal injuries. And then the seatbelt sign is a bruising pattern in the pattern of a seatbelt. And this can cause injuries anywhere a seatbelt touches you. So you can have even like vascular injuries in your neck. You can have rib fractures in your chest, your abdomen, anything could happen. Um, So those are just some things to look out for when you're doing this exam or when you're seeing this on your shelf exam. From here, you can move to the upper extremity. So the normal language here is like the right axle is clear, the right anterior arm is clear, right posterior arm is clear. You can say things like that. If you notice any lacerations, if you notice active bleeding, these are things that you would note in this segment. You can also note the firmness of the compartments, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And then also if there's like obvious deformities, you can say like the right upper extremity is deformed that's like good enough. They don't need to know like, okay, is the scaphoid bone broken? Like we'll figure that out. But like what is going on with their arm in simple terms? So we have gone so far through the head and neck exam, chest, abdomen, upper extremity. Now we will move to the pelvis. So in the pelvis, the normal language is like pelvis is stable. So things that you would look for down here, we talked about this in the last episode, but having an unstable pelvis is a concern for pelvic fracture. But some other things that are a little bit more subtle that would clue you into a pelvic fracture would be like bruising over the iliac wings, bruising at the pubis or the labia. These can be indicative of pelvic fractures. Um, and then you can also sometimes see blood at the urethral meatus. So when you're doing your genitourinary exam, you may see blood. Or if you're doing a rectal exam, you can feel what's called a, quote, high-riding prostate. And this is where the prostate is higher than you expect it to be if you are able to appreciate this. That makes you concerned for a urethral injury. That makes you concerned that there may be something mechanically that has pulled the prostate up there and that sometimes can be a pelvic fracture. Talking about the pelvis, with an unstable pelvis, if you are concerned for a fracture in the bay, you will wrap the pelvis with a pelvic binder or a bed sheet. A quick word on pelvic binders as well. You will not wrap every single kind of pelvic fracture. Typically, you, if the pelvis is unstable and you are concerned for an open book pelvis, a binder will be helpful. There are some pelvic fractures that will not benefit but will not be hurt by a pelvic binder. But one type of pelvic fracture that you do not want to wrap, which is why you should not wrap pelvic fractures indiscriminately, is when you have like a bilateral SI joint fracture because when you bind the pelvis and pull that ring together you're actually going to widen the fracture and that causes more shearing of those blood vessels and more bleeding which is what you're trying to prevent with the pelvic binder and um, use some towel clamps to really clamp that down and put that pelvis back where you found it some interesting anatomy that will give you some like gold star points if you know about it is called the corona mortis and the corona mortis this is also another name for the crown of death, but this is an anastomosis between either the external iliac artery or the deep inferior epigastric artery and the obturator. And when this is injured in a pelvic fracture, this can cause a ton, a ton, a ton of bleeding. And so this is something that radiologists are looking for when patients have pelvic fractures, especially looking for active extravasation because there can be role for surgery or interventional radiology to intervene in this case if the corona mortis is injured. For the genitourinary exam, we sort of already mentioned it, but normal language would be like genitals are atraumatic. There's no blood at the urethral meatus. If there is blood at the urethral meatus, we already talked about this concern for your like ureteral injury. You can be concerned for a bladder injury, pelvic fracture, all sorts of things. And so all you need to say is that there is blood at the urethral meatus. You don't need to throw a differential out there because all sorts of things could be happening um, that would cause that. But that is your genitourinary exam. You can also do a rectal exam if it's indicated. And sort of at that time, you would examine for 
signs of trauma. So if there's like a ton of bleeding from the rectum, that's something that you want to know. And then you also want to note rectal tone as well. A quick aside on the rectal exam. If you do a rectal exam and it's abnormal, you may need to find a sensory level. So if you're concerned for like a C-spine injury, a spinal cord injury, and you think that there are neurologic deficits, you may need to find a level of sensation where it begins and where it ends in a patient. I was bamboozled with this in the bay one time and so what I learned after the fact is that if you use like paper clips or something to mark penetrating injuries when you go to x-ray you can use the end of the paper clip to kind of like poke gently but enough that it's like a pinprick and people would feel it so you're not penetrating the skin obviously but like a little poke with the paper clip end and that is to sort of like help localize and so you can go I mean, like we know that T10 dermatome is the umbilicus. And so you can go above and below and don't say like, can you feel me touching you at your belly button? You would say like, let me know when you feel something sharp. My mistakes that I made when I did this the first time was I was using my hands, which would work if the patient was like responding and appropriate, but this patient was not. And so I was using my hands and then I was saying like, do you feel me touching your left leg? Which is not like helpful because they can pretend that they are or, no, or are not feeling you if you give them a specific location. So I would say um, sort of be familiar with a few different landmarks as far as what a sensory level is concerned. And if you get asked about the rectal tone, just remember that S2, 3, and 4 keep your poop off the floor. And so we're thinking about the pudendal nerve when we're thinking about rectal tone. And so if you have poor rectal tone and you're concerned for a neurologic injury, you would be concerned that the nerve roots S2, 3, and 4 are involved in that process some hints and tricks that would have helped me if I knew this the first time I did it. For lower extremity, the normal language would be something like anterior right upper thigh is clear, anterior right lower leg is clear. So obviously you're going to be examining the anterior of the patient first because we have to pay so much attention to like spinal alignment and C-spine precautions. We are not going to examine the anterior and the posterior side at the very same time for a lot of these places. And so we'll talk about that a little later, but just so you know, you are going to be looking at anterior before you look at posterior. So that's something to note. Um, some things for legs is like a shortened and externally rotated leg is sort of a clue that there is a fracture of the femur, specifically the fracture of the neck of the femur. And the reason that it is shortened and externally rotated is that there is unopposed pole of the iliopsoas. If you have any deformity of the legs, we talked about this in a prior episode of the legs or the arms, they should be put in like stiff traction devices that will probably be available in the emergency department. Um, This is not like formal traction where you're putting weights and stuff on it, but this is just to sort of stabilize it and put it back in its anatomical position so as to prevent further bleeding and neurologic injury if possible. And also remember, I mentioned very briefly talking about compartment pressures. You should remember that patients with fractures, especially long bone fractures, are at risk for compartment syndrome. So you should assess for like the softness or the firmness of the limb as well during your exam. And you can do this with a gentle squeeze. And if it feels super firm, that's something that you want to know. You can also at this time examine for distal pulses um, if you feel like you can do that efficiently. If you have concern for vascular injury, you probably also will be doing like APIs and doing some Dopplers of the lower extremities. And so that may be something that happens as an adjunct to your secondary survey. So we just talked about rolling. So now we have examined the anterior of the patient and now you, the patient will be rolled to one side probably. So if you are standing on the right side, they will roll to the right. So now you on the right side of the bed are looking at the back of the patient. When we're talking about rolling, typically you're going to maintain C-spine precautions and do log rolls. Log rolls are to basically like thoracic and lumbar spine precautions. There are some instances where you do not need to do C-spine precautions and there is a handy dandy MD calc recipe for calculating if you need to do this. And more so than like knowing that the MD calc thing exists, 
it's important for you to know that there are criteria when thinking about who needs C-spine precautions and who does not. I don't know if you've ever interacted with a patient in a C-collar, but they are extremely uncomfortable. I once had a patient with like 75% total body surface area burns, partial and full thickness, and he was the most concerned with his C-collar. So they are not comfortable for patients, and if we can get them off or not put them on in the first place, that's helpful. But again, we want to keep our patients very safe. So thinking about this, this risk stratification device is called the Nexus Low Risk Criteria. And so some of the things in the MD Calc formula are things that would make you want to have C collar. So obviously there's going to be like outside of this calculation, like if you have any concern for a cervical spine fracture, the safest thing is to put the C collar on because the last thing you want to do is have a paralyzed patient when you did not need to do that. But when thinking about this in a patient who seems relatively stable, you're not really worried about it, but you want to know, do I put a C collar on or not? If they have a distracting injury, we spoke about this in a prior episode, but a distracting injury is like a super big injury somewhere else that would be causing them a lot of pain that would make them maybe forget that their neck is broken. So this would be like a femur fracture, a gunshot wound somewhere. If they have any like big injury anywhere, like total body surface area, like greater than, I don't know, like even over 10%, I feel like would to me would be a distracting injury. That is going to make you want to put a C collar on. If they're intoxicated, this can dull their response to pain. You're going to put a C collar on them. If they have any tenderness of their neck at all, C collar. If they have focal neurological deficits, C collar. If they have altered mental status, C collar. This is like the straight to jail pathway. Distracting injuries, straight to jail. Intoxication, tenderness, believe it or not, both jail right away. That's the nexus low risk criteria. Basically, if none of those things are true for your patient and you have no, absolutely no concern for a cervical spine fracture, you can omit using one. Please use that wisely. And obviously you won't be making this decision, but that's what goes into it. So then when looking at the back, the normal language is like back is atraumatic. There are no step offs or bony tenderness. And that's sort of what you will note. And a step off is feeling the spinous processes and if something is out of alignment, that is a step off that you will note. For the buttocks, you will look at the buttocks, you will know that they're atraumatic. At this time, you can do your rectal exam. You can have a non-bloody and normal toned rectum. That would be your normal language. And if it is bloody or there is abnormal tone, that is something that you will note as well. You can also note if the prostate is high riding if you're able to appreciate this. At this time, you will be able to see the posterior leg, and you can say the posterior right leg or right upper leg is atraumatic, right lower leg is atraumatic. You can say those things. Um, And then somebody will repeat this exam on the left side, so the patient will roll. You will help roll the patient so that their left side is now available for examination. That is sort of the secondary survey. I know that's like a lot of physical exam findings, but I hope that this was helpful in thinking about different things that you could find on exams that could be cluing you into a specific diagnosis and that also some of this discussion was helpful for you in framing your approach to the general surgery and trauma questions on your shelf exam. I hope that this was useful to you and I will talk to you in the next episode. Bye. That's it for today's podcast. You can support this podcast and receive exclusive educational content on Patreon and find us on Instagram at Sterile Field Guide. Questions and requests can be submitted to our Gmail at sterilefieldguide at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. And until next time, may your retraction be superb and your suture tails be the perfect length.